They say love makes a house a home. Buddy was so happy to go. They're going to live on a large property, and uh, it sounds very storybook. But love can be blind. I made a joke out of it, and it wasn't a joke to Buddy. And when strangers are in your home, it can be dangerous. He was basically a hostage. He was being tortured. Even deadly. This was definitely evil with the cavalry. skirts of Houston, a man notices someone sleeping by the side of the road. But when he loops back and the figure hasn't stirred, he calls 911. Initially, uh, a jogger had called in the police dispatch that something was wrong with the person, that, and he'd seen a, um, a man laying in a ditch, thought that maybe they were drunk or passed out or sleeping. at the scene and observed the, that there was a body laying off the roadway in some grass. The body had evidence of trauma, uh, cuts, bruises, but the unusual thing about it was the clothes were, were very clean. You would expect that if it was a hit and run, which we kind of thought maybe that's what it was going to be at, at first, the clothes would have been tore up, uh, would have been dirty, but, but that wasn't the case. Cleaned up, he's been washed up, he ain't got no blood on him. And no blood at all. It just, just like somebody had been beaten severely. We knew that uh, something was wrong with the scene immediately. Gun wounds. I don't see no stab wounds. One shoe was laying on the ground next to him, the victim. And the other shoe was on his foot, but it was on the wrong foot. So you could tell somebody hastily dressed him. Glasses over here. And threw him out there on the scene. While evidence tells police that this was no hit and run, it tells them nothing about who the dead man is. And when investigators have a body with no name, they first look to the names that have no bodies. We checked our case files, our reports, to see maybe if somebody reported someone missing. Find anything? Nothing yet. That wasn't the case. So we, we checked the next city over, Jacinto City, to see maybe if someone reported someone missing. Hey, yeah, it's uh, Assistant Chief Pruitt over at Glenna Park here. Listen, I was wondering if you could help us out here. We're gonna miss you. It was at that time we found out that a woman by the name of Suzanne Basso. I think you got a hit. Or Louis Lusso. Age is right. Also known as Buddy. Yeah, that's, Had come that's... in to the police station to report a person missing. The cops head over to Suzanne Basso's home in Jacinto City to learn more. Sue Basso lived in a working class neighborhood uh, east of Houston, and her home was very much like the others. There was nothing remarkable about it. It's just very modest, working class. I went up and knocked on the door. I, uh, Suzanne answered the door. Hi, can I help, can I help you? Ma'am, are you the person that reported Buddy and Lusso missing? Yes, yes, I, I, I am. Have you found him? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure, ma'am. She doesn't know where he is. She thinks he might be off with one of his little girlfriends. I, I think, actually, he, he left me for some Mexican woman. Suzanne isn't the only one home. I said, who is, who is that looking out the window? And she said, my son, James Domel. Could you please ask him to step out here? Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. He's a little mentally slow. He doesn't really know what's That's going fine, on. That's fine. I, I, I can explain anything. I still need him to come out here right now anyway, please. Go ahead. You know, for obvious reasons, security and safety reasons. So he stepped to the door. This uh, man needs to ask you some questions. Yeah, well, this morning we had a report about a person lying by the side of the road with no ID, and he matched the details that you gave to the police. So I need you all to come downtown right now and ID the body. The, the, the body? Yes, ma'am. Is, is it him? Oh, oh, my God. We're not sure, ma'am. I need you to come with me, all right, with that? You can do that? James? Yes. So I loaded them both up in the car, and we went to the scene. <laughs> Pruitt decides Suzanne is in no shape to ID the body. James. I questioned him. I said, well, would James be able to know who he is? And I figured he he would be able to observe the thing a little better because we needed to know who the victim was. So she remained in the car. We walked up to the scene. We didn't enter the scene itself, but he could see from the distance. And he's staring 
in that area completely and didn't take his eyes off that area. And when we got up there, I turned and looked at him. Is that Buddy James? Yeah. That's Buddy. Is that Buddy? Is that Buddy? Suzanne is hysterical and says, that Buddy is your Buddy is your Buddy. Look, ma'am, uh, things just uh, confirmed that it was uh, Mr. Musa. <laughs> I got them in the car and asked him if he'd accompany us to the police station to uh, give us a play-by-play -play as to Buddy's whereabouts and take a statement from him. Now that police know the man in the ditch is Buddy Musso, they're left with one very pressing question. Who wanted him dead? When Buddy left, he probably was the happiest that he's ever been. We couldn't believe that. We couldn't believe that. How can anybody do this to Buddy? corpse of Buddy Musso has been found on the side of the road just outside of Houston. Police have little evidence and no witnesses. They do know one thing. He's a long way from his home back in New Jersey. Just a ferry ride from Midtown Manhattan, Cliffside Park is a small safe borough of only 30,000 people. Crime rate? Very little. You could put apple pie on the windowsill. It'll still be there in the morning. And at the Cliffside Seniors Housing Complex, things are even safer still. And one person everyone knows here is Louis Musso. We always knew him as Buddy, Buddy Musso. <laughs> he was passionate, you know, he was passionate. I want to sing him a song that I wrote. And it was almost in a childlike way. That's what endeared him to so many people. Even though Buddy is no senior, a mild cognitive disability brought him here as a resident. Buddy was the sweetheart of a guy. Simple. He wasn't the brightest kid on the block, but lovable. He's the girl that I dream of every day. Buddy just had a good heart and a good soul. He was a, a really respected, well-liked man. He was gentle and kind. He was happy. He loved family. He liked dressing up as a cowboy. He was a guy that liked country music. I'm going to meet her someday. And we're going to follow up. Buddy played the guitar, banjo, and the drums. He was um, just, he really loved music and loved singing. He was married and he had a son, Anthony. Um, and his wife died when Anthony was two. And he was just devastated by his wife's death. He was really a family guy. And he just wanted family. Buddy's son had grown up and they grew distant, leaving Buddy truly alone. Buddy was actually uh, looking for a girlfriend. A new love and a new family. It all seems like a pet dream till the carnival sweeps into town. There's really nothing as pretty as a carnival, is there? Oh, I love them. I, I come whenever the church has them. I'm actually just visiting, and uh, when I go by something like that, I just have to go. I love them too. Hey, do you want some popcorn? Yeah. Can I have two popcorn, oh, please. No, I can pay for it myself. No, I can pay for it. It was at the Epiphany Church in, uh, in Cliffside, uh, and every year they have a carnival rides for the kids and the little areas where you can win a doll and buddy always used to go to those he'd go to start and stay there till the finish so what do you think of my chances well i'm pretty sure these games are rigged but you never know well maybe you'll be my lucky charm maybe he met this particular person and she showed him a little bit of attention and i guess affection also so one more as far as buddy was concerned that was the key to a relationship that could have blossomed into something that he was looking for does you wear my lucky charm I'm Suzanne. I'm, I'm Buddy. Though the fair soon pulls up stakes and vanishes, and while Suzanne's vacation ends, the romance doesn't. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> He's on a payphone in the lobby. Ten o'clock. And just who were you talking to at ten o'clock at night? Uh, my girlfriend. Oh, I said she's got a friend I'll go with you. He said, it's not like that. He said, he says, I'm in love. I just talked to her on the phone, and we're going to talk again. He insists that he's smitten with a woman named Suzanne, a 44-year-old mother of two who lives in Buddy's favorite place on Earth. She lives in Texas. <laughs> Buddy was probably very lonely and felt very much alone in the area he was in. I, I usually go see some country music, you know. Suzanne herself was seduced by the romance of Texas. She's originally a northern girl, north of the border even from Halifax, Nova Scotia.
Like Buddy, Suzanne had been married before, and that union had been splashed all over the pages of the Houston Chronicle. Their wedding announcement trumpeted their love and many impressive details of their lives. She was an oil heiress, a gymnast, a ballerina, a dancer. She was educated in these uh, fancy schools in Ireland and had been a, uh, in a convent at one time. Carmine Basso uh, was, by all accounts, was a gentleman, decent man. He had a Medal of Honor in the Vietnam War. Carmine ran a uh, private investigation agency and security firm. But not long after the pair found love, tragedy struck. Carmine died in Houston. He was found in his office. Uh, and it was a, an esophageal uh, issue, uh, like a severe acid reflux that continued. It was ruled natural causes. Although Suzanne is back in Texas, the long-distance relationship continues through the fall and into the spring. The relationship obviously stepped up. She would call up there. He became very excited. There's this woman in My Lady Love, as he called her. Buddy actually felt that for the first time in a long time, he had met his soulmate. At Suzanne's frequent urging, Buddy considers pulling up stakes to move into her home in Jacinto City. From what we heard, that she was going to shower him with gifts. And they're going to live on a large property, and uh, it sounds great. It sounds very storybook. Hey, Buddy, how you doing? Hey, Unc. Hey, I just got a picture from my, my, my girlfriend, Susanna Basso, from Texas. Oh, I said Texas. He said, I mean it, Unc. He says, I love her. I'm going. I said, all right. We were all kind of saying, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, buddy, that's all right. You can, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Things are really looking up, buddy. You're really looking up. He got on a bus that morning and went to Texas. I never saw him again. The body of 57-year-old Buddy Musso has been found by the side of the road in Texas. A terrible fate for someone who followed his heart there so just two months before. It's no time, cowboy. Much obliged, ma'am. Much obliged. Buddy Musso got on a bus in New Jersey and came here. You see this guy dressed up in this, this little western shirt. He got his boots on, his hat on. You're going to love it here. It's warm and dry and no depressing winters. New love, new state, new home. Buddy's life when he first came down here was fine. I believe that um, he was happy. He enjoyed living with Suzanne. Morning, sunshine. Morning, sweetheart. Yes, what? Mm -hmm. I got you a job. A job? Yes. She was a security guard. She worked for her own company. He was a night watchman. Oh. All well, things happened to him that he didn't have the phone before. Now I got a job, I got a uniform. The fact that they gave him a badge and a stick and a flashlight had to be overwhelming to him. Like, wow, look at me, you know? Suzanne is even taking over all the messy details that Buddy's always found unmanageable. I think we should deal with your finances. Since we both know that you're not good at that stuff, I can take care of it for you. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Okay, and um, I've got life insurance. Oh, I don't like life insurance. It's a jinx. <laughs> well, don't worry, because all you have to do is sign your name here and initial here. Okay. Hello? Yes, just give me one second. It's for you. For me? Mm -hmm. Oh! While he's delighted to be at Suzanne's side, Buddy's new home isn't exactly what he was expecting of his blue blood girlfriend. You had a working class home, very modest, very cluttered, like a hoarder almost. There were plastic boxes, there were computer equipment, television sets, all sorts of stuff everywhere. And a lot of it had kind of an Irish theme, you know, there was a lot of green, there were shamrocks on the walls. In one side room they converted into an office, so they had a computer and it was cramped and full. But then you had some high-end elements. There were copies of Colonial Williamsburg magazine, the Foundation magazine, the New Yorker, there was Tchaikovsky compact discs, you know, classical music. But the house isn't just filled with stuff. Suzanne's son, James, takes up a lot of space, too. He wore black rim glasses, short hair, military-style haircut, uh, wearing the fatigues, a uh, G.I. Joe wannabe would be the best way to describe it. And James is a little odd. He looks like an extra off full metal jacket. He, he, was, he was just this, just this little misfit guy. He's never been in the Army. He's never served his country. But he's playing pretend. But Buddy gets along with everyone. 
Everybody loved him. He was just a very lovable guy. All right, guys, food's ready. James isn't the only one Buddy has to win over. His new home in Jacinto City is always packed with friends. Suzanne had collective, just an odd collection of people. They were different ages. She did have an ability on some people to draw them in in a very personal way. She would often bring uh, people down on their luck into their home. Buddy, this is everyone. My old friend Bernice, uh, her son Craig, her daughter Hope, and Hope's fiance Terrence. I'm not exactly sure how Bernice and that group got together. I do know that they had become friends and were friends for a couple years. She would visit them at uh, their apartment and they would come over to Jacinto City. Today. Oh. Won't last forever. It's just how it is now. Okay. Okay? Have fun. Love you. Love you too. This crowd is often in Suzanne's home, even when she's working her frequent long shifts at her security company. What you doing, buddy? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. You wanna play a tune? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, come on, buddy. Play some hey, yeah. It's like a chart. Atta boy. He always wanted to play, no matter what it was, even if it was for uh, uh, lunch. What, what song do you want me to play? Cold Beards. I don't know that one. Buddy, this is a concert, a one-man show, right? We need some beers here. This is... Oh. Right? Yeah. Ah. I thought we need some beers. Yes, yes. It doesn't take long before they start asking Buddy to do all kinds of small chores. Here you go. He's a man who was used to doing okay. all of these things for people back when he's in the senior center. Hey, buddy. What is this? Beer's not cold enough. Oh! Not cold enough. Helping people out, getting things for people. Hey, buddy. Yeah. It smells really bad in here. I think maybe you need to empty the ashtray. Mm. Well, you heard the lady. What are you looking at me for? Now here he was made to be almost in servitude right. towards them. Over a period of weeks, uh, Buddy began to experience abuse. talking to the Mexican ladies. This group would go to a Chinese restaurant. They would be eating. Everybody would get big plates of food and, and except for Buddy. And not allow him to eat. <laughs> and they would throw food at him. I think he still felt that it might change. I'm sure Buddy felt that everything would be okay. He could probably win those people over. It's a southern thing. You got a quick frog, throw it into the water. If the water's already boiling, the frog will jump out. Put the frog in the water, slowly turn up the heat. The frog's not going anywhere. And the heat is being turned up. They would go into the restaurant. They would leave Buddy out in the car handcuffed so that he couldn't get away. This is a guy who's turned into a prisoner. He, he was basically a hostage. Faster, move the leg, move the legs. There was a field outside of Bernice Aaron's apartment. <laughs> oh, now finish, finish, finish. And the police officer arrived. Buddy was out there. He was huffing and puffing, and he couldn't run. But he was trying. The police officer kind of took Buddy off to the side to find out what was going on, because Buddy was obviously older than those two. He wants us to make him do this. He likes doing it. They told me I had to run. I just wanted to go and see some guy. The police officer walked Buddy, along with Terrence and James, to Bernice's apartment. Knocked on the door, Suzanne answered. Buddy, what happened? These boys, they make that man run sprints. Sprints? Oh, James, you know boys will be boys. Are you okay, buddy? Let's go inside. Uh, what's with those eyes? Oh, it was a terrible thing. He was jumped a few days ago by three Mexicans. It was terrible, but he's fine now, aren't you, buddy? This is where I want to be. I want to be with Suzanne. Yeah, come on, come on. People wondered why Buddy didn't leave. Buddy being the type of a person that he was, he was committed to his relationship. While the policeman feels that things are amiss with this odd collection of people, he doesn't know the half of it. This was a very, very dysfunctional group. Very dysfunctional group. They can beat him, they can torture him. They can belittle him. And nobody will stop him. Musso has moved from New Jersey to Texas looking for storybook love. 
But the fairy tale has taken a grim turn. They had a little mat um, that children use when they're in kindergarten, where they, when it's nap time. That's what they had for Buddy. And they made Buddy kneel on it. If he uh, tried to lie down, he'd get punished. If he tried to stand up, he would get punished. If he wanted to go to the bathroom and they wouldn't let him and he wet his pants, he would get punished. watching this guy. Torturing him, beating him, keeping him in line. And even when they were beating him and torturing him, he complied. He just wasn't, he just wanted to get along, just wanted to be liked, just wanted to be part of a family. James. reaches a deadly peak one sultry weekend at Bernice's apartment. Suzanne was working. Suzanne didn't trust just uh, her son to watch Buddy, so that's why she brought him over to uh, Bernice's house because there were more people there. Different place, same treatment. Ooh. Buddy! Get up, get up. We hungry. Want to make some food? Yeah, go ahead. They look like a group of people that had maybe been picked on in their lives because they're just... Um, kind of sad looking people that didn't appear if you just looked at them but they were successful in life these people were all people that heaped their life's problems on buddy and the things that they had experienced in life they gave to him it's horrific what started to happen to this guy <laughs> and in august 1998 two months after moving to houston Buddy vanishes. Hi, I'm calling to report a missing person. So when a body is found at the side of the road two days after the call, police pay a visit to the Basso home. <laughs> Suzanne and James go to the scene where James identifies Buddy's corpse. Both are taken to the police station where they're interviewed separately. At this point, they weren't suspect. I was... Suzanne was hysterical, crying, very upset. She thinks that he went down to visit some Hispanic women at the Warshateria. Uh, maybe he left me for this Mexican woman. In the other room, James is telling a very similar story. Look, I think he ran off with some woman, all right? Some Mexican woman, probably. I, I remember him doing laundry. Still, yeah. Pruitt suspects James knows more about Buddy's death than he's letting on. Go back to his hometown in New Jersey. I don't know. And without a doubt, it appeared to me. And again, with my experience and suspicion, that he knew what he would find prior to him getting there. Yeah. There was no great shock. It was almost an immediate answer and said, yes, that buddy. And the position of the victim and all would have made it almost impossible for him to make that determination. And I'd almost walk and clean up on the victim. From that distance, you couldn't tell if that was a man or a woman. And in short order, the story comes flooding out didn't intend to kill him all right we didn't know he, he was dead when when i left him there i had come back he didn't open his eyes yeah we killed him we killed him he pretty much it confessed that uh, they'd had buddy over at the bernie sarin's apartment and that he misbehaved and they did this looks like we got a bunch of people to pick up to flesh out what happened the others are quickly rounded up the story they tell horrifies the officers. They were just aghast. They were amazed at this brutality. <laughs> Cops see brutal stuff all the time. This was a whole new level. And James has one last shocking secret. It was quite obvious that Buddy was brought down here for a reason. After the murder of Buddy Musso, James O'Malley delivers a sudden and shocking confession. Yeah. We killed the guy. We killed him. We brought Bernice, Craig, 
Terrence and Hope to the police station for questioning. Everybody started point, pointing fingers at each other. Then the dance began with all the suspects. Yeah, the dance that police have to go through to get statements. You're wasting time! Armed with James's statement, Pruitt goes back to Suzanne for her story. Suzanne, your son just confessed. Well, this startled her quite a bit. Suzanne pointed mainly at her son. I didn't do anything. I just wanted to protect James. He's my son. He's not right in the head. Don't you know that? She was but he's a benefactor and his protector. I was working doubles. I had no idea what they were doing. I had no idea what they were doing. And I just got seen marks on his body when he came home. But the rest of her family offer a very different version of events and drop a bombshell on the cops. Suzanne, my mother, she was there. She told us to do it. Her son pointed a finger at Suzanne. Craig, Terrence, and Bernice pointed fingers at Suzanne. They were scared of Suzanne. The I had nothing to do with this. I want to go home. It was obvious that Suzanne was the ringleader. She was the one that told him to do all the bad things to her. Come here, Bill. She was the one that initiated the beatings. Suzanne had total control over that group. I think somebody wants to get punished, Jinx. She was probably smarter than the rest of them. I, I can't say that they respected her, but I believe they feared her. Um, and I don't know how she was able to have such dominion over them, but she did. After all the statements were taken, I started to put the picture together of what, what Buddy might have gone through. And it was quite obvious that Buddy was brought down here for a reason. I have two popcorn, please? Oh, no, I can pay for it myself. No, I, I want to. She saw Buddy as an income source, so I think she schemed to have Buddy come down and live off of Buddy's Social Security money and pretend to be his girlfriend. In short order, her role as loving fiancé fades. The people in New Jersey would try and call him, and at first, Suzanne would put him on the phone and he would talk. It was very much controlled by Suzanne. And after a while, she would say, well, Buddy's not here, or Buddy's outside, or Buddy's doing something else. Uh, okay, well, let me see what I can do. One second. Suzanne Basso did a really good job at keeping the outside world out. Nobody can interfere with what they're doing. Nobody can stop their plan. Buddy Musso is theirs. Suzanne types up a will stating that everything Buddy owns would be hers when he dies. It's like leave everything to Suzanne, even the drum set. Nobody else gets anything, not his family members. Then there is his insurance policy. Buddy initialed it, every page. It was his initials, L.M. Louis Musso. It had an escalator clause in it from 15 to 60 grand, I believe, if he died a violent death. Buddy wanted to leave. I think he wanted to try to leave. They found a note in his pants written, you know, get me out of here, basically. I, I, I just think he didn't have the means. What do you think you're doing? James! Hammer and nails, now! For Suzanne, Buddy is worth more dead than alive. Buddy became a problem for Suzanne. He was an irritant to her. I just believe that she just wanted it over with. She's just tired of dealing with it. Sit down. When police interview all the suspects, they learn how Suzanne solves her problems. In the last few days of his life, the, the torture was dialed up to a terrifying extreme. It happened in the last week of August 1998 in Bernice's apartment. There was no one that did not hit him. He was hit with all manner of things. He had such a descriptive type of a face where you, you knew every emotion that was going through Buddy's mind. I just couldn't picture the look on his face 
uh, those last couple of days, there must have been a look of puzzlement as to what what happened. Why is she doing this to me, the person who loved me? How could she do this to me? <laughs> really bad. I think I need an ambulance. Well, you need an ambulance when I'm not done with you, Debbie. She didn't even want to throw the vacuum thing in the car. James! Cut! Suzanne's son kicked him with a steel toed boot. with a wire brush and, and it's this skin peeling mix of cleaning fluid. They turned the shower on to rinse him off because he was all bloody. And left the shower running and just left him in the bathtub. left in the dust and his killers are arrested the savage murder sparks a media storm it was a big news story because it was six capital murders in galena park with a horribly beaten up man when the name suzanne basso hits the front page it rings more than a few bells thanks to suzanne's wedding announcement from a few years before she called herself an oil heiress and she had this big long name that had probably eight names to it it's absurd. Nothing about the wedding announcement added up. It just didn't make sense. In fact, Suzanne had grown up on the east coast of the U.S., not Canada. And there was no oil money, no gymnastics, no endless names or private schools. From all accounts, she was a lovely little girl. She was uh, the youngest daughter in a family of eight. But the little girl had herself seen the face of evil. Suzanne Basso was an abused kid, sexually, physically. Her parents were apparently some pretty brutal folks. She was, in turn, brutal with her kids. She carried it on to the next generation. Her son, uh, James O'Malley, there were indications that she had a sexual relationship with him. His mother totally controlled him. As details of Suzanne's past come flooding in, the death of Carmine Basso looks more than a little suspicious. If you look at some of the things that happened with letting you so, there were times when people were denied food, and then you read that Carmine Basso suffered from malnourishment, which could have led to some of the esophageal issues. It really does make you wonder uh, what, you know, what went on in his life. While many suspect Suzanne may have tortured Carmine as well, Buddy's death remains the focus of police investigations, and all six players are charged with capital murder. James O'Malley got life in prison. Bernice got 80 years. Her son Craig got 60 years. Terrence got life. And Hope Aarons got 20 years. Suzanne was the only person we wanted to prosecute and seek the death penalty um, because she was the ringleader. In October of 1999, she's convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death. She's executed on February 5th, 2014. You know, in this business, uh, you see evil with a small E and you see evil with a capital E. And this was definitely evil with a capital E. That woman, Suzanne Basso, was evil. Buddy Musa was, was looking for love. He was looking for someone to share the rest of his life with. 
Suzanne Bassett was looking for love. She was looking for a payday. Back in New Jersey, the loss of Buddy still haunts his friends. To think somebody would do something like that to a kid like that. They're not even a human being. They're animals to do that to another human being. I have regrets that I didn't try to stop him from going. I never thought he would do it. But he did. And I feel so bad that that happened to him.